Hi friends. So today we'll be discussing the amendments in the subject of direct tax applicable for May 2021 exam CA inter. Now November 2020 the last exam of CA inter that happened and May 2021 the exam that is about to happen the budget has changed the finance act that is applicable has changed and so the student has to study the law from or with respect to the new budget there are quite a lot of amendments so this video is basically highlighting all those amendments i'll be explaining the amendments on a chapter wise basis and we'll be discussing the amendments in two parts first part we will be discussing all the amendments that are up to the heads of income so the initial chapters that you have the introduction the residential status chapter and your five heads of income we will discuss all the amendments up to the heads of income in this video and in the next video we will take up amendments in the other chapters of your ca inter syllabus chalo so let's begin now when we are talking about may 2021 exams you will be tested for previous year 2021 assessment year 2122 in your november 2020 exams it was previous year 1920 so now the big change that will happen is that you will be asked questions wherein the details of income that are earned in financial year 2021 will be given to you and you will have to calculate the tax that is payable in assessment year 2122 now as far as your tax rates are concerned there is absolutely no change in the tax rate as compared to the last financial year which means the same tax rates that were applicable for previous year 1920 assessment year 20 sorry assessment year 2021 the same rates are applicable for may 2021 exams also there is no change in the slab rate there is no change in the provision of rebate the provisions of surcharge and health education cess are also identical but the thing that you have to take care is instead of previous year 1920 it will it has to be now previous year 2021 ha huh. you may remember this one small thing that when you are talking about tax rate applicable to a domestic company the provision that used to exist was that if your turnover 2 years ago that means previous year 1718 if this turnover was less than or equal to 400 crores then you were as a domestic company supposed to pay tax at the rate of 25% of your total income total income of course for previous year 1920 the provision is exactly identical but with a small change can okay, now this will not be the year 1718 it will be the year 1819 because you are talking about paying tax for 2021 so the concept still remains the same it's just a minor technical change if you are looking to pay tax for previous year 2021 as a domestic company you go back to the turnover that you had 2 years ago if that turnover did not exceed 400 crores 2 years ago then today on your total income you will pay tax at the rate of 25% else you will pay tax at the rate of 30% so broadly speaking as far as tax rates are concerned there is no change this is the only minor technical change now moving ahead now we are looking at an important amendment see 
if you remember your syllabus after your introduction you had a chapter residential status residence of an assessee where firstly you you used to study how do you decide a uh, individual as resident non resident resident would be further bifurcated as resident and ordinarily resident resident but not ordinarily resident then we used to study residential status of companies partnership forms that was the first part of the chapter and then we also had the second part of the chapter which told us the scope of income that was section 5 which incomes are taxable depending on your residential status we used to decide which incomes are taxable in india now there is no change in the scope of income so section 5 is absolutely same but there is a very major significant change in residential status of individual if you refer the revision test paper rtp that has been issued by icai they have included quite a lot of mcqs and quite a lot of questions based on this amendment so this discussion of amendment is something very important now the original provision was something like this we are talking about residential status of an individual where if you remember first of all we had the first basic condition basic condition number 1 which said that if your stay in india during the previous year that means the year for which you are deciding residential status in our case now it will be 2021 if this is a minimum of 182 days if you satisfy this condition then you are treated as a resident of india if this condition is not satisfied then you have a second condition the second condition basic condition number 2 got divided into two parts it said that the stay in india of this individual during the previous year should be minimum 60 days and the total stay in india for Four years preceding the previous year should be minimum three hundred and sixty-five days. So your basic condition number two gets divided into two parts. One, the stay in India for the current year that should be minimum sixty days. and the total stay for the preceding 4 years excluding 2021 past 4 years should be minimum 365 days now if you satisfy this basic condition then you are a resident but if this basic condition is not satisfied then you are treated as a non resident so this is basic condition 1 basic condition 2 which is to determine your residential status now there is no amendment in basic condition number 1 but then basic condition 2 has undergone a slight amendment in a specific situation one of the points that you may remember studying was that if if you are an indian citizen or a person of indian origin who is already abroad who is staying outside india and this person 
comes to India for a visit, for a temporary purpose, for a visit comes to India during the previous year. Now in this case, basic condition 2 is not applicable. That means your process of determining the residential status becomes very simple. You just have to check basic condition number 1. If basic condition 1 is satisfied, you are a resident. Basic condition 2 is not applicable only in this situation. So, your determining of residential status becomes quite simple in this particular situation. This is the original provision and this provision is still existing. But now the amendment that they have introduced talks of this very situation. And it says that if you are an Indian citizen or a person of Indian origin who is outside India and who comes to India for a visit during the previous year. This is the same condition that we had. But now something additional has been prescribed. His total income other than the income from foreign sources, his total income but excluding the income from foreign sources. So, what do you mean by this? We are going to consider the income of this individual but not the income arising from foreign sources. In simple words, this entire thing, total income other than income from foreign sources, this means we are talking about the income arising in India, the Indian income. If this Indian income exceeds rupees 15 lakhs, so the entire situation is that you are an Indian citizen or a person of Indian origin, you are already abroad and you are coming into India for a visit. But this Indian citizen, this person of Indian origin has income arising in India. Forget the income arising outside India, forget the income from foreign sources. Income arising in India exceeds 15 lakh rupees. Then for this type of a person, basic condition 2 will be applicable, but basic condition 2 will be applicable with a small modification. The modification is your stay in India during the previous year should be the provision that was 60 days has now become 120 days and your total stay in India for 4 years preceding the previous year is 365 days or more. So, look at this. This was your basic condition number 2. It said total stay in India should be minimum 60 days. Now, this 60 days has changed to 120 days, minimum 120 days. And 365 wala condition is absolutely the same. The point to remember, when will this 120 days wala condition apply? Basic condition 2 which has this 120 days wala clause will be applicable if you are an Indian citizen or a person of Indian origin who comes to India for a visit, who is already abroad and who comes to India for a visit and his Indian income exceeds 15 lakh rupees. That's why I said, K, this exception that we have studied already, this is not completely deleted. This still applies. The, the thing that you are seeing on your screen right now, this is only talking about an Indian citizen or a person of Indian origin who is abroad and who comes to India for a visit during the previous year. This stuff tells you that basic condition 2 is not applicable. And the amendment that we are talking about also has this set of wordings. An Indian citizen or a person of Indian origin who is outside India and who comes to India for a visit during the previous year. But the amendment has this extra thing that your total income arising in India should exceed 15 lakhs. Then basic condition 2 will apply with a modification. Which means, you could think like this, that 
if i am talking about an indian citizen or a person of indian origin who has come to india for a visit during the previous year there are two possibilities that i am thinking if his indian income does not exceed 15 lakh rupees if his indian income does not exceed 15 lakhs that means it's exactly 15 lakhs or less than that then this does not get covered by the amendment so my provision is that basic condition number one is applicable see there is no amendment in basic condition one basic condition one used to be there is still there but basic condition number two basic condition one always was applicable basic condition two is not applicable this is something that you are aware indian citizen or a person of indian origin who is coming to india for a visit and has an indian income exceeding 15 lakh rupees this is the new provision that has come into existence but will basic condition number one still be applicable of course yes there is no amendment as far as basic condition one is concerned so basic condition one still applies basic condition two the way we are aware the way we know basic condition two this is not the condition that is applicable 60 days all condition is not the condition applicable what is now going to be applicable we call it as modified basic condition two so it is modified basic condition two that is applicable i call it as modified basic condition two because there is a small change over 60 days has become 120 days that means if i am an indian citizen and i am in france and i'm coming into india for a visit you cannot blindly just decide my residential status only by checking basic condition one i'll repeat what i said if i'm an indian citizen who is staying in france and i'm coming into india for a visit this information is insufficient in the sense i cannot only check basic condition one to decide my residential status now i will need that extra information what is the amount of my total income arising in india if it is 15 lakhs or less if it's 15 lakhs or less then i will only check basic condition one if satisfied resident if not satisfied non-resident but if my indian income is above 15 lakhs then basic condition one satisfied resident not satisfied I will not jump to the conclusion straight away that this is a non-resident. I will check basic condition number two with a modification that my current year stay should be minimum 120 days and my past four years ka stay should be minimum 365 days. If this modified basic condition two is satisfied, then I am a resident of India. If I do not satisfy modified basic condition two also, then I will be treated as a non-resident. So this is the first amendment which targets Indian citizen, person of Indian origin who are already abroad and are coming into India for a visit. Now let us extend this. Let's extend this amendment. All of us are aware that once we decide an individual as a resident, there are two possibilities that can exist one you will be called as resident and ordinarily resident second you are a resident but not ordinarily resident so basically what is the meaning of all these terms? I am sure in 
you are already aware of it. I am just stating the obvious. This word resident, this is talking about your current year status. Current year, are you staying in India for the requisite number of days? These words, ordinarily resident, not ordinarily resident, they are talking about your past year's data. You may be aware about those two additional conditions. You decide somebody as and ordinarily resident if both the additional conditions are satisfied. If both additional conditions are not satisfied, then you call the person as a resident but not ordinarily resident. Step one is to decide the individual as resident. Step two is to decide the individual as a resident and ordinarily resident, a resident but not ordinarily resident. Now, the second amendment that we are discussing is connected to the first amendment. What is my first amendment? Talking about this Indian income arising, which being Indian income meaning arising in India, which is above 15 lakh rupees. Now, when that happens, my stay in India has to be minimum 120 days in the current year and my total stay over the last four years should be minimum 365 days. Theke. Now, the extra part, how do I decide somebody as and ordinarily resident or not ordinarily resident if he falls in the amendment? So, my provision here is, I am talking about an individual who is covered by amendment number one, which means I am talking about this individual who is already abroad, Indian citizen, person of Indian origin and is coming to India for a visit and his total income arising in India exceeds 15 lakhs. So, for this this type of a person, you have to check modified basic condition two. The second amendment is, if modified basic condition two is applicable and the individual becomes a resident of India because he satisfies modified basic condition two, because he satisfies modified basic condition two, then he will be treated as resident but not ordinarily resident. If modified basic condition 2 is applicable, so I am talking about this Indian citizen or a person of Indian origin who is coming to India for a visit, but he is staying in India in the current year for 182 days or more. Then although modified basic condition 2 is applicable, you need not check it. He is already a resident of India via basic condition number one. Then he will be treated as a resident and ordinarily resident. See, what does this mean? The significance is, I am talking about an individual who is covered by amendment number one. Fine. Now, let us imagine this individual, his stay in India for previous year 2021 is minimum 182 days. So, think what will be his residential status? In this case, he will be treated as a resident of India because he is satisfying <coughs> basic condition number one. So, he is a resident of India. Achha, imagine that this person is staying in India for less than 120 days in the year 2021, less than 120 days. So, he does not satisfy basic condition number one. He is covered by the amendment. So, modified basic condition 2 is applicable in his case, but he is staying in India for only for less than 120 days. 
which means he is not satisfying even the modified basic condition too. That means this person as far as residential status is concerned, he is a non-resident of India. So once he is a non-resident of India, I don't need to attach anything extra to his status non-resident. That's it simple. But if he is in India for minimum 120 days, that means he is satisfying modified basic condition too. But he is staying in India for less than 182 days. So we checked basic condition 1 was not satisfied. We checked modified basic condition 2 and it got satisfied. And so this person is now treated as a resident of India. So the second amendment is telling you that somebody who becomes a resident because he satisfied the modified basic condition 2 will directly be treated as resident but not ordinarily resident which means by implication somebody who becomes a resident of India by satisfying basic condition number one he is a resident because he satisfies basic condition number one he will automatically be treated as resident and ordinarily resident. If you fall in the amendment, so if you are an Indian citizen or a person of Indian origin who is abroad and who comes to India for a visit during the previous year and your Indian income exceeds 15 lakhs, then if you become a resident as per modified basic condition 2, you are a resident but not ordinarily resident. If you are a resident because you satisfy basic condition number 1, which is anyways applicable in all cases, then you are a resident and ordinarily resident. And if you do not satisfy basic condition 1, modified basic condition 2, then automatically you are a non-resident. The thing that I would also like to mention here is that in both these situations, in both these situations, additional conditions are not applicable. The amendment does not ask you to check additional conditions. Additional conditions will be applicable to a normal situation. A normal situation meaning an individual who is not covered by the amendment. So you are an Indian citizen who is already staying in India. Then additional conditions have to be checked. You are an Indian citizen who is abroad and is coming to India for a visit. But your total income, Indian, Indian income is 15 lakhs or less than that. Then you are not following in the amendment. Then it's a normal case the way we used to normally calculate our residential status. So additional conditions will apply. Your the second amendment that is introduced is connected to the first amendment. And it has made it very simple. It first amendment has changed basic condition two, And then if you become a resident as per that changed modified basic condition two. So you are automatically a resident but not ordinarily resident that is the second amendment. If you are a resident as per basic condition number one then also you don't need to check any additional conditions in this case you will be resident but sorry resident and ordinarily resident. So this is my second amendment and residential status ka third and the last amendment this is something really interesting. Amendment number three. points to observe. First of all, I would want you to read the amendment. This is called as deemed residency. Residential status and citizenship are altogether different. You become a citizen of a country by birth. You become a citizen of a country if you actually make an application to the government of that country. 
सिटीजनशिप इज डिफरेंट रेसिडेंशियल स्टेटस ऑफ एन इंडिविजुअल डिपेंड्स ऑन हिज स्टे इन दैट कंट्री फॉर अ सर्टन नंबर ऑफ डेज ग्लोबली वेन यू एनालाइज द इनकम टैक्स एक्ट ऑफ ऑल द कंट्रीज मेजरली एवरीबडी एवरी कंट्री हैज बेसिक कंडीशन नंबर वन एप्लीकेबल इन देयर डोमेस्टिक इनकम टैक्स एक्ट your stay in that country should be minimum 182 days this is a condition universally found in many income tax acts united states of america us is a country which focuses more on citizenship when it decides the taxable income india focuses on the residential status rather than citizenship and there are many other countries like india which tell you which income is taxable which income is not taxable depending on the residential status not on citizenship us is an exception the amendment that is introduced is connecting residential status with citizenship this amendment is talking about an indian citizen whose total income other than income from foreign sources so it's the same concept i am talking about indian incomes indian income exceeds 15 lakhs so i am talking about an indian citizen this point does not tell you where the indian citizen is in india outside india coming to india for a visit it does not mention any of those words it is very general it talks about an indian citizen but this indian citizen ha is having income in india exceeding 15 lakhs and the important thing such individual is not liable to tax in any other country so he is an indian citizen his income arising in india is about 15 lakhs but he is not liable to pay income tax in any other country because of the rules and regulations of that other country because of residential status because of any other criteria now such an indian citizen is deemed to be resident but not ordinarily resident for india government of india observed many many cases of people staying or spreading their stay in different different countries and becoming a non resident in all the countries 182 days wala condition is majorly applicable in almost all countries of the world if you stay in a particular country for minimum 182 days you are a resident of that country this is you can say a kind of universal condition so i spread my stay i spread my stay over four countries i spread my stay i stay 100 days in country 1 45 days in country 2 120 days in country 3 another 100 days in country 4 i spread my stay over 3 to 4 countries in such a way that i become a non resident in every country please remember basic condition number 1 is universally found in all countries income tax act basic condition 2 that we studied minimum 60 days modified basic condition 2 that we have studied minimum 120 days that is not existing in every other country what is existing universally is that 182 days wala condition so out of 365 days of a year i spread my stay in 3 to 4 countries i become a non resident of all the countries because i do not satisfy the criteria mentioned in each country's income tax act so i become a non resident everywhere now this type of an individual can avoid his income tax by manipulating his stay like this and so the provision of deemed residency has been introduced deemed assumed you will be assumed to be a resident of india if you are an indian citizen if your income exceeds 15 lakhs and you are not paying tax in any other country then as per this section you will be assumed to be a resident resident but not ordinarily resident so again here 
you will agree with me that additional conditions are no longer applicable in fact i'll go a step better you guys will agree with me on this also basic conditions are also not applicable you are assumed to be a resident of india assumed to be a resident of india you do not need to check any basic condition you do not need to check any additional condition you are a resident but not ordinarily resident so this deemed residency now small small points to observe this deemed residency is applicable only if you are a indian citizen meaning this amendment is not applicable to a person of indian origin if you are a person of indian origin then the concept of deemed residency is not applicable then you have to actually check basic condition 1 modified basic condition 2 if it is applicable additional conditions if they are applicable you have to formally check it to decide this person of indian origin as resident or non resident the concept of deemed residency is only applicable to indian citizen second this amendment will only apply if your total income is above 15 lakhs total income meaning indian income i mean so if your indian income does not exceed 15 lakh rupees then this amendment number 3 of deemed residency is not applicable so if your indian income is 15 lakhs or less and you are an indian citizen then you may fall in amendment number 1 you are an indian citizen your indian income is above 15 lakhs if you are coming to india for a visit then you fall in amendment number 1 modified basic condition 2 will apply if you are an indian citizen and your indian income is above 15 lakhs but you are not coming into india for any visit you are in india only you are in india then it's a normal case then it's an absolutely normal case basic condition 1 basic condition 2 additional condition 1 additional condition 2 everything has to be checked so this concept of deemed residency if it has to apply you have to be very specific we are talking about an indian citizen only we are talking about an indian citizen whose indian income exceeds 15 lakhs only then the concept of deemed residency will apply then the third thing deemed residency deemed residency concept will not be applicable if this individual pays tax in any other country also i am an indian citizen i am having income arising in india i am also having income arising outside india say in the in the country of mauritius and i am paying income tax in mauritius i am an indian citizen my income in india is above 15 lakhs but i am paying income tax in mauritius also on my income in mauritius whatever income arises in mauritius i am paying income tax to the mauritius government then i don't fall in this deemed residency concept then i am an indian citizen and my income is above 15 lakhs i may fall in this amendment number 1 if i am coming to india for a visit if i am not coming into india for a visit i am an indian citizen whose indian income is above 15 lakhs but i am not coming to india for a visit then i will be falling in the normal case so basic condition 1 basic condition 2 additional 1 additional 2 everything will apply so that's what i'm trying to highlight ke if you are talking about the amendment of deemed resident of india the concept of deemed residency is a very specific concept it will be applicable only to indian citizen whose income in india is above 15 lakhs 
and who does not pay tax in any other country of the world then and only then you are treated as a resident but not ordinarily resident of india that is why at the beginning i said okay because of this concept of deemed the residency citizenship is connected to residential status now because you are an indian citizen and you are satisfying the other attached conditions you will be treated as a deemed a resident of india so as far as residential status is concerned these are your three amendments first amendment is talking about basic condition to getting modified second amendment if you become a resident as per that modified basic condition to then you are automatically resident but not ordinarily resident and third amendment is a concept of deemed residency this is your chapter number 2 residential status these are the three amendments now moving ahead there is no amendment in the head of income of house property house property what you studied for november 2020 exams is the same for may 2021 exams but of course the previous year will change so all the questions that you had practiced for house property whatever questions you have already practiced just change the year from 1920 to 2021 and the questions and the solutions will remain the same income from salaries two amendments both the amendments they are they are quite significant they are a uh, you may think like this that they are a benefit to the employee now let me first of all highlight the situation that used to exist before the amendment only then we will be able to appreciate the effect of the amendment and how is it going to affect our salary sums first thing when we are talking about employer's contribution to recognized provident fund we have studied that this amount is exempt from income tax up to 12% of salary this is the amount of exemption and after subtracting this exemption if any amount still remains then this is taxable for the employee and i'm sure you might remember this small point this word salary this includes three things basic salary of the employee dearness allowance in terms of employment and commission which is based on a percentage of the turnover this is the the provision that is mentioned in section 7 of the income tax act section 7 talks about a heading income deemed to be received so you may be a resident you may be a non resident but the provident fund is being maintained in india so the amount of income that will be taxable for the employee is this in excess of 12% of salary wo wala amount employee ke liye it will become taxable this is the first point then you may also remember the second point in this section that if there is any interest that is credited to the recognized provident fund then this interest is exempt up to 9.5% per annum and whatever amount remains this amount is taxable for the employee so if the interest credited in the recognized provident fund is at 11% so 9.5% proportionate interest will be exempt and it is only that excess 1.5 which will be subject to tax 
and the third income that we have studied that when the employer makes a contribution to the approved pension schemes currently you may be aware that there are two pension schemes which are applicable in india one is called as the national pension scheme and the other one is the atal pension yojana so these are my two pension schemes that are currently operative in india when the employer makes a contribution to this pension scheme initially we consider it as fully taxable now you may be you may remember this small thing that ha huh, initially we consider it as fully taxable subsequently you get a deduction of this amount under section 80 ccd also you will remember this provision as well that when we are talking about perquisites one of the perquisites is section 17 to clause 7 this section 17 to clause number 7 says that when an employer makes a contribution to the superannuation fund then his contribution is exempt up to rupees 1 lakh 50000 and whatever is the excess amount this excess amount is taxable for the employee so these are the provisions that we are aware these are these provisions are existing up to previous year 1920 employer's contribution to recognize provident fund up to 12% is exempt the excess is taxable taxable of course under the head salary interest that is credited to the recognized provident fund is exempt up to 9.5% and the excess is taxable under the head salary employer's contribution to pension scheme is first of all taken as fully taxable under the head salary subsequently when you reach gross total income then you take a deduction under 80 ccd 2 that's a deduction from gross total income so currently my focus is we are calculating salary income we are talking about salary as a head <coughs> an employer making a contribution to the superannuation fund even this amount will be taxable under the head income from salary this is the situation existing up to previous year 1920 now what is the amendment introduced this section of perquisite 172 clause number 7 this section has been redrafted in simple words this section has been rewritten first of all we'll see what the redrafted provision is and once we see that we'll try to decode it we'll try to understand what are the what are the small small things that we need to take care about the redrafted section says that now you have to take the employer's contribution that is made to number 1 recognized provident fund number 2 superannuation fund number 3 contribution made to the pension scheme now you take a total of these three contributions made by the employer and this redrafted perquisite tells us that you will get an exemption against this total amount the exemption is up to 
सेवन लैख फिफ्टी थाउजेंड एंड ओनली द एक्सेस अमाउंट विल बी टैक्सेबल फॉर द एम्प्लॉई इट विल बी टैक्सेबल फॉर द एम्प्लॉई इट इज अ सेक्शन ऑफ वर्क विजिट सो बट ऑफकोर्स इट इज गोइंग टू बिकम टैक्सेबल अंडर द हेड इनकम फ्रॉम सैलरी नाउ दिस इज वॉट द रीड्राफ्टेड प्रोविजन इज देर आर टू थिंग्स टू ऑब्जर्व फर्स्ट वॉट हैज बीन रीड्राफ्टेड सेवनटीन टू क्लॉज नंबर सेवन हैज बीन रीड्राफ्टेड वॉट वॉज द ओल्ड सेवनटीन टू सेवन दिस प्रोविजन वॉज द ओल्ड प्रोविजन द ओल्ड प्रोविजन हैड अ लिमिट ऑफ वन लैख फिफ्टी थाउजेंड अप टू वन लैख फिफ्टी थाउजेंड कॉन्ट्रीब्यूशन मेड टू द सुपर एन्युएशन फंड वॉज एक्जेंट नाउ इफ दैट क्लॉज सेवन हैज बीन कंप्लीटली रीड्राफ्टेड इट मीन्स द ओल्ड लिमिट ऑफ वन लैख फिफ्टी थाउजेंड इज नो लॉन्गर अवेलेबल इज नो लॉन्गर एप्लीकेबल विच मीन्स वेन वी आर टेकिंग वेन वी आर गोइंग टू टेक एम्प्लॉयर्स कॉन्ट्रीब्यूशन टू सुपर एन्युएशन फंड वी विल हैव टू टेक द फुल अमाउंट यूर employers contribution to pension scheme also we will have to take the full amount for our working so this is the first thing to observe okay the old limit of 1 lakh 50000 is gone now it is a new limit of 7 lakh 50000 but this limit is applicable to an aggregate this limit is applicable to the total of three contributions made contribution made to recognized provident fund superannuation fund and pension scheme so we will not have any exemption of 1 lakh 50000 now second thing to observe what has been redrafted 17 subsection 2 clause 7 has been redrafted so there is no amendment introduced in section 7 section 7 still is existing the way it is so if you are the employee and your employer is making a contribution to your recognized provident fund account there is no change in section 7 they have not introduced an amendment by saying section 7 is not applicable they have not introduced any such amendment so section 7 section 7 still applies as an employee if your employer makes a contribution into the recognized provident fund you are entitled to take this exemption under section 7 this means that when we are applying the new provision employers contribution to recognize provident fund this has to be only the taxable portion up to 12% of salary is anyways exempt under section 7 so now when we are taking an exemption under the new section 172 clause number 7 i will include only the taxable portion of employer's contribution to rpf and that is subject to an overall limit of 7 lakh 50000 let's put all of this in numbers let's take an example see we will be able to understand the impact of the amendment only after we make a comparison between the old provision and the new provision so let's say employees basic salary is 16 lakhs the dearness allowance in terms of employment is say 8 lakh rupees and say the percentage commission on turnover is 6 lakhs so as per the meaning of that term salary we have a total salary of 30 lakh rupees for this employee now let's assume employer's contribution to number 1 recognized provident fund is rupees 5 lakhs employer's contribution to super annuation fund is say rupees 2 lakhs and employer's contribution to the pension scheme 
किससे रुपीज फाइव लैख सेवेंटी थाउजेंड नाउ वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस दिस एग्जाम्पल फर्स्ट विथ रेफरेंस टू द ओल्ड प्रोविजन एंड देन विथ रेफरेंस टू द अमेंडेड प्रोविजन वॉट यूज टू हैपन अप टू प्रीवियस इयर नाइनटीन ट्वेंटी अप टू प्रीवियस इयर नाइनटीन ट्वेंटी वी यूज टू टेक एम्प्लॉयर्स कॉन्ट्रीब्यूशन टू रिकॉग्नाइज प्रोविडेंट फंड इन माई एग्जाम्पल दैट अमाउंट इज फाइव लैक्स वी यूज टू से अप टू ट्वेल्व परसेंट ऑफ सैलरी एग्जामेशन इज गिवेन टू मी बाई सेक्शन नंबर सेवन तो ट्वेल्व परसेंट ऑफ थर्टी लैक्स थ्री लैक्स सिक्सटी थाउजेंड बिकम्स एग्जाम फ्रॉम टैक्स दैट मीन्स द डिफरेंस ऑफ वन लैख फोर्टी बिकम्स टैक्सेबल दिस वॉज द फर्स्ट थिंग सेकेंड एम्प्लॉयर्स कॉन्ट्रीब्यूशन टू सुपर एन्युएशन फंड the contribution made is 2 lakhs and as per the old provision section 17 subsection 2 clause number 7 just for our reference i am writing down in the exam you don't have to write it this way old but just to draw distinction as per the old provision 1 lakh 50000 was exempted and it was only the balance 50000 which was taxable and employer making a contribution to the pension scheme was initially fully subject to tax under the head salary so 5 lakh 70000 in my example is taxable that means the total taxable amount which we would include under the head salary would be 6 7 60000 140 50 5 70 7 60 would be subject to tax under the head income from salary this is what used to happen now let's look at the new provision in previous year 2021 that is after the amendment what will happen now section 7 is still not amended section 7 still is existing the way it is so there is not going to be any change in the section 7 working which means employers contribution to recognize provident fund 5 lakhs less exempt as per section 7 ka working salary 12% so 3 lakh 60 became exempt no change in the working but now the new clause of perquisite will come into picture where i will now say employers contribution to super annuation fund first of all i will have to take the entire 2 lakh rupees in this total working then i will add employers contribution made to the pension scheme this amount is 5 lakh 70000 take a total now my total will be 770 plus 140 which means 9 lakh 10000 and from this 9 lakh 10000 i will subtract an exemption under section 172 clause number 7 of 7 lakh 50000 which means what will be subject to tax is only 1 lakh 60000 under the head income from salary so you can observe for yourself as per the old provision the amount taxable was 7 lakh 60000 have a look the old provision 7 lakh 60 was taxable right at the top of the screen you can observe and as per the new provision the amount taxable is 1 lakh 60 so on one hand the individual limit of 1 lakh 50000 for super annuation fund gets deleted but there is an overall aggregate limit 
of 7 lakh 50 thousand but section 7 being unamended section 7 being still the same the way it is i will have to take into account that 12 percent of salary exemption after that include the taxable portion take the other two contributions made compare it with 7 lakh 50 thousand only the excess will be subject to tax for the employee have a look first you take employers contribution to recognize provident fund take your exemption 12 percent of salary this is the taxable portion add the other two take a maximum of 7 lakh 50 combined exemption balance amount remains taxable this is the first amendment second amendment a new perquisite clause has been inserted this was our clause number seven clause number seven which has been redrafted after clause seven clause seven a has been introduced it says the amount of interest dividend or any such increase on the portion of employers contribution that is taxable under section 17 to 7 which means this portion this taxable portion on this amount whatever amount of interest or dividend gets credited on this taxable portion that shall be considered as a perquisite under clause number 7a and shall be taxable for the employee in the manner prescribed by central board of direct taxes this manner prescribed by central board of direct taxes this is yet to be prescribed the cbdt is yet to come out with a formula on how this working should be done but basically what it says is that if i go back to my numeric example As per the amendment, 1,60,000 will be taxable. What is 1,60,000? 1,60,000 is the employer's contribution, which is in excess of 7,50. And so we are taxing it. On that 1,60,000, whatever interest gets accumulated into the provident fund account, superannuation fund account, pension scheme account, instead of interest, if let us say dividend etc. gets, uh, gets credited, then interest dividend whatever yearly amount gets credited into the fund that will be treated as a separate perquisite and it will become taxable how to find the taxable amount that method is yet to be prescribed so currently for examination purposes you can keep this theory in your mind that a new clause 7a has been introduced and you can just ensure that you remember this drafting this is the way in which clause 7a is there in the income tax act also so you remember this drafting and if at all there is any question coming up you can write a theory note saying that it is taxable but the formula is yet to be prescribed of course again one thing that goes without saying that there is no amendment in section number 7 so this provision interest credited to rpf up to 9.5% is exempt there is no change this provision still remains the way it is so in a question if the question specifically says interest credited to recognize provident fund we can still apply 9.5 percent exemption and calculate the balance taxable amount but this extra provision created that on the excess amount which is taxable as a perquisite in clause number seven on that extra amount if there is any interest for dividend credited it will be taxable under clause number 7a the formula is yet to be prescribed so these are your two amendments in the chapter of salaries one 7 lakh 50 exemption excess amount taxable but it is a total of three contributions made by employer second clause number 7a next head of income in sequence we have is income from house property no amendments in income from house property all the questions that you have solved for your november 2020 exams you can just change the financial year you can solve those questions again for your practice there is absolutely no change in the income tax act when it comes to house property third head of income profits and gains of business profession yeah quite a few important amendments quite a lot of amendments pay attention to this this is a 
big head of income and it is regularly part of your question paper either as your compulsory question or you can also have a separate question based on PGBP or for that matter many question papers you will observe that PGBP forms part of your compulsory question also and a separate small question is also asked in your paper. First amendment. You guys will remember that there is additional depreciation available under section 32. Now the amendment that has been introduced, it is not an amendment actually, it is an interpretation. You may remember studying that additional depreciation is allowed at the rate of 35 percent instead of 20 percent. If you set up your manufacturing in the backward areas of those four states, Telangana, Andhra Pradesh, West Bengal, Bihar. So, if you set up your manufacturing anywhere else in the country, except for the backward area of those four states, then the additional depreciation rate is 20 percent. So, my provision looks something like this. Additional depreciation will be calculated at the rate of 35 percent, 35 percent on the actual cost. Additional depreciation is never calculated on WDV basis, it is always calculated on actual cost. Provided my manufacturing is in the backward areas of those four states, Telangana, Andhra Pradesh, West Bengal, Bihar. So, additional depreciation will be at the rate of 20 percent of your actual cost in all other cases, in all other cases, in all other situations. Now, the point to observe here. 35 percent extra amount of additional depreciation was available if your new plant and machinery was installed on or after 1st of April 2015 that is when this 35 percent provision came into income tax act. But this is where I would like you to focus before 1st of April 2020. That means if I simplify it, it means up to 31st March 2020, if you install brand new plant and machinery in the backward area of those four states, then additional depreciation is calculated at the rate of 30 percent, uh, 35 percent, sorry. So why is this date important? This date is important because now we are in previous year 2021. As far as previous year 2021 is concerned, additional depreciation rate will be at 20 percent on the actual cost of plant and machinery irrespective of where you set up your manufacturing. In simple words, I would say that 35 percent rate is no longer applicable because it is very easy to interpret. The higher rate of 35 percent was available only when the plant and machinery was installed in a certain time frame from 1st April 2015 to 31st March 2020. So, let us say if a taxpayer, if an assessee is setting up his manufacturing in the backward area of Telangana, but that is happening in the current year 2021, then 35 percent is no longer applicable. The provision was applicable only if the machine was installed up to 31st March. That means 35 percent will no longer apply, it will be 20 percent. So, today for previous year 2021, additional depreciation is at the rate of 20 percent only. The 35 percent provision that you have studied no longer applies. Huh. There is one reason why you still have to remember the 35 percent rate. 
we are aware about another provision of additional depreciation which says that if additional depreciation is allowed at half rate why is it allowed at half rate it is allowed at half rate because the plant and machinery is put to use for less than 180 days if additional depreciation is allowed at half the rate then the balance half will be allowed as a deduction in the next year this is also a provision existing in additional depreciation this provision combined with the 35 percent provision needs to be remembered what if there is an assessee who is doing manufacturing in the backward area of any of those four states let's say for example in the backward area of the state of Bihar and brand new plant and machinery has been installed on 2nd February 2020 observe the date carefully 2nd February 2020 that means this is previous year 1920 now what happens for previous year 1920 my additional depreciation that will be allowed is the actual cost multiplied by what shall be the rate the rate i am in the backward area of the state of bihar i have installed the machine before 31st march 2020 so the rate applicable will be 35 percent but since it is put to use for less than 180 days it will be 35 percent ka half and the moment I say half depreciation, half additional depreciation is allowed in 1920, the balance half will be allowed as a deduction in 2021. Now, if the balance half is going to be allowed as a deduction in 2021, what will be the calculation in 2021? I cannot apply 20% because this machine is eligible for additional depreciation at 35%. So, additional depreciation will be calculated in this year at 35 percent into half rate this is the only reason why we have to remember the 35 percent rate if this same assessee who is doing manufacturing in the backward area of bihar is going to install a plant is going to install a brand new machine on 3rd of february 2021 that means now i am talking about previous year 21 22 i'm sorry now I am talking about previous year 2021 that is our current year. Now additional depreciation will be calculated at 20% whether you are in the backward area of Bihar or anywhere else in the country. But if the machine was already installed in 1920 and half rate, half rate was allowed, so it was half rate of 35%. So the balance half will now be allowed in the year 2021 that will be at 35%. This is the first amendment to remember. Second amendment. 35 AD. Capital expenditure on specified business. On the face of it, this amendment appears very simple, very straightforward. We are aware that for this capital expenditure on specified business, we get a deduction of 100% from the net profit. Capital expenditure that means fixed assets that are incurred in this specified business. You do not put them into the block of assets. You straight away take a 100% deduction from the net profit. After taking this deduction, if the answer comes out to be a negative answer, that means your computation gives you a loss. This loss will be set off only against profits of specified business. The balance loss will be carried forward infinitely without any maximum time limit 
and you will set off this loss in future against the profits of specified business. This is all that we are aware. But the implication is the amendment now says 35 AD has been made optional for the assessee. So if the assessee wants, he can choose not to claim a deduction under 35 AD. Not to claim a deduction under 35 AD. Which means he is doing a specified business. For this, he is incurring the cost of fixed assets. He has a choice of taking a 100% deduction. But if he desires, if he so wants, he can not claim 35 AD deduction. So what will he do? It is a business. He has purchased fixed assets. And 35 AD has now become optional. So if 35 AD is not claimed, then obviously he will put these fixed assets into the block and he will depreciate it. So, the amendment says that section 35 AD is optional. Now, what are the what are the what are the significant changes that will happen let's compare if section 35 ad is claimed by the assessee then number 1 he will get a 100% deduction from the net profit number 2 on sale of this fixed asset the entire sale proceeds are going to be taxable as PGBP income under section 28. Number 3 35 AD specifically says that you have to use this fixed asset in the specified business only for a span of 8 years. There is a lock-in of 8 years if you claim a deduction under 35 AD. Until now, this is what you had studied and this will still continue to apply. The section has been made optional. So, the initial reaction that a student gets is, so 35 AD is giving me 100% deduction. Why the hell will I not claim it? Why will I take my fixed asset, put it in the block and depreciate it at 10%, 15%, 40%? Instead, I would go for 35 AD and take a 100% deduction. On the face of it, this argument seems fine. But now start thinking. If section 35 AD is not claimed because of the amendment, you do not claim the deduction since now it is optional. Then what would you do to the fixed assets? To the fixed assets, you would put them in the block and you would depreciate them. So depreciation under section 32 will now be allowed. But then this also means that when there is sale, of this particular asset, charging section 28 will not apply. This fixed asset for which 35 AD deduction has not been claimed deliberately is now part of the block. So you will reduce the sale proceeds from the block. And we are aware that when you reduce the sale proceeds from the block, the depreciation amount gets adjusted. If the block becomes negative, then capital gain arises. If the block ceases to exist because you sell off all the assets, then there can be either capital gain or capital loss. But if the block still continues after the sale, this is there, there will be depreciation. This is a general concept of block of asset. Now it is going to be applicable to these fixed assets also. I am an assessee who is doing a specified business, but I choose not to take 35 AD deduction. So I'll take my fixed assets, I will put them in the block, 
as and when in future I sell them, either there will be still depreciation because the block will continue to exist even after the sale or there can be the chapter of capital gains applicable but charging section 28 will not apply. The sale proceeds will not be fully subject to PGBP income. You will have to reduce them from the block. And there is no concept of lock-in period now. When you put the asset into the block, there is no concept of lock-in period in section number 32. The lock-in concept is in section 35 AD. So if an assessee is claiming a deduction under 35 AD, he is getting an advantage that he can straight away reduce the cost of fixed assets from the net profit. But there are two more things that he needs to take care. He has to keep the asset in the block. Sorry, he has to keep the asset in the specified business for eight years. Otherwise, the deduction under 35 AD will be withdrawn. And if he sells the asset, the entire sale proceeds are taxable under PGBP. So there is an advantage. I can take a full cost deduction but I have to keep the asset in the specified business for 8 years. If I sell, sale proceeds are taxable. If I start using it for some other purpose, then the deduction gets reversed. The deduction allowed earlier will now be added to my profit. This is for an assessee who claims a deduction under 35 AD. But now because 35 AD has become optional, I can choose not to take a deduction under 35 AD. Then I will put the asset in the block. In that year, Instead of getting a 100% deduction, I will get a, a much lesser deduction. But then there is no concept of lock-in. I can sell the asset whenever I want. I don't have to keep the asset for 8 years in the specified business. And even when I sell the asset, the sale proceeds will not be fully subject to tax. It will be adjusted from the block. So this is a major, major amendment. 35 AD is now optional. Next amendment. This amendment actually was not introduced by Finance Act 2020. It was introduced sometime about in Finance Act 2017 or so. Three years ago, the budget had introduced the amendment applicable with effective from previous year 2021. You would have studied that when contributions are made for research, contributions made to outsiders. we used to get a weighted deduction of 150 percent. If you contribute 100 rupees to an outsider for scientific research, you were allowed to subtract 150 rupees from your profit. This was the provision existing up to previous year 1920. The amendment introduced is that the weighted deduction is gone. With effect from previous year 2021, such deduction shall be reduced to 100% instead of 150%. In the entire section 35, wherever there was a weighted deduction, that weighted deduction has been replaced by a simple deduction of 100%. That means in terms of question solving, it has actually become very simple. Section 35, contribution made for scientific research. If I am talking about a PNL account for previous year 1920 and the contribution made was say 1 lakh rupees and let us assume the net profit was 7 lakhs. What we used to do in our question was we used to take net profit 7 lakhs. Either I would disallow the 1 lakh rupees and then under section 35 take a weighted deduction of 150 percent that is 1 lakh 50 thousand and this would become my taxable PGBP. But if I am now going to apply the amendment so if I am talking about our current year previous year 2021 in this year also the assessee made a contribution of 1 lakh, say net profit 7 lakhs. Now the deduction is exactly 100%. There is no concept of a weighted deduction, which means in simple terms, I would say this 1 lakh 
is the deduction allowed which implies that the 7 lakh rupees itself is the taxable PGBP. In other words, I need not give any effect in my computation of PGBP. So, this has actually become very simple. Until now, what we used to do was we used to specifically remember that in the PNL account, if we saw any such contribution, we would take a 150% deduction. Now, I don't need to do anything. At best, in our solution, I will write a note that with effect from previous year 2021, deduction is restricted to 100%. Full stop. Since the amount is already debited to profit and loss account, no further adjustment is required. So, this has this amendment has actually become very simple. Next amendment. The same thing. Research in biotechnology was allowed a 150% deduction. Now, it has been reduced to 100%. Ha! 43 CA. Before 43 CA, I would like to take up this one amendment. This is a section where we used to disallow the expense. If you make a payment about 10,000 rupees on a single day and you do not use the prescribed modes of payment, then the expenditure that you pay via those prohibited modes, via those non-prescribed modes, that payment amount used to be disallowed. This was section 40A subsection 3. And, okay, so first of all, section 40A subsection 3 told us that if my expenditure exceeds rupees 10,000, and for this expenditure, if the payment that is made on a single day exceeds rupees 10,000 and the mode of payment that is used by the assessee to make this single day payment is not account pay check is not account pay bank draft is not electronic clearing system pay attention please is not an electronic mode prescribed by income tax rule number 6A B B A. If your expenditure exceeds 10,000 for which you are making a single day payment about 10,000 and you do not use these modes of payment, these modes of payments are not used, then, then what happens is that such amount paid, such amount paid means the amount that is paid via these prohibited modes cash is prohibited. You make a payment about 10,000 in cash, this section will apply, it will be disallowed. Bearer check is a prohibited mode, crossed check is a prohibited mode, account pay check is fine, account pay bank draft is fine, electronic clearing system is fine, rule 6 ABBA modes are fine, I will come to that rule 6 ABBA in a minute. If you do not use these modes, then whatever amount you have paid, not using these modes, using the other prohibited modes shall be disallowed. It shall be disallowed under the section 40A3. Now, what are these electronic modes? Rule 6 ABBA. We are talking about credit card, debit card, internet banking, IMPS, RTGS, NEFT, Aadhaar Pay, 
beam payment so basically you are not preparing a check here but eventually the payment is reflected in your bank account you swipe a credit card or a debit card you make the payment online through internet banking neft rtgs imps or you use this uh, electronic modes digital payment modes so the payment can be traced in the payer's bank account and the receiver's bank account then the expenditure will be allowed as a deduction for the payer if you do not use these electronic modes that are prescribed do not use the modes then the amount paid shall be disallowed originally in section 40a subsection 3 these electronic modes as per rule 6 abba were not there the section originally drafted covered only account pay check account pay bank draft and electronic clearing system bus over a period of time people started using the electronic modes government also started promoting those electronic modes now what used to happen was this is the section which talks about disallowance government has also introduced something called as rule 6dd what is rule 6dd rule 6dd is exceptions to section 40a3 meaning certain transactions are highlighted in rule 6dd if you are doing a transaction which falls in rule 6dd then this 40a3 disallowance will not get attracted even if you have used cash even if you have used bearer check expenditure will be allowed rule 6dd talked of certain practical situations where it may not be possible for the payer to draw a check and a, a list has been created now specifically one particular point here was if payment is to be made on a bank holiday or a bank strike this was one of the exceptional situations that if you are supposed to make a payment on a bank holiday bank strike you can't make a payment through account pay check account pay bank draft via electronic clearing system the payment will not be cleared so it was created as an exception it was created as an exception and it was perfectly valid also but after that government introduced rule 6 abba where these mode of payments credit card debit card imps etc was introduced now on a bank holiday or on a bank strike you can still swipe a credit card and make the payment you can still make the payment through internet banking you can still make the payment online so there is no further need of this exception in rule 6 dd so this was deleted which means now if you make a payment on a bank holiday bank strike it is no longer an exception to 40a subsection 3 then 40a subsection 3 will definitely apply if you do not use this prescribed mode of payments then the amount paid will be disallowed now the SSE cannot take an argument that i was making a payment on a bank holiday or on a bank strike and therefore the check could not be cleared absolutely fine if it's a bank holiday or a bank strike you make the payment through internet banking through imps rtgs then and only then the expense will be allowed so this is a very minor amendment but it's something that you just need to remember in certain solutions we could make an assumption that it is assumed that the payment is made on bank holiday and therefore expense is allowed even if it is paid in cash now we can no longer make that assumption if the question specifically says that the payment was made in cash on 15th of august bank holiday independence day payment was made in cash on independence day earlier we used to allow that expense now we will have to disallow it because this exception has been deleted next amendment now i would like to take this 43 ca this is something important from your studies you may remember that 43 ca is identical to section 50 c in the chapter of capital gains section 50 c and section 43 c a are absolutely identical one is in the chapter of pgbp the other is in the chapter of capital gains what am i talking about first of all 
let me put up the section in front of you if land and building are held as stock in trade then section number 43 ca applies if land and building are held as a capital asset then section 50 c applies to prevent the black money transactions that happen in property dealings 43 ca and 50 c these two sections are existing primarily speaking what do these sections say both these sections tell you that if your consideration amount is less then the stamp duty value then for calculating income whether under the head pgbp or under the head capital gains you will take the stamp duty value so when i am talking about the word income in the chapter of pgbp i am talking about the sale amount if land or building is held as stock in trade it means i am talking about a real estate developer i am talking about a builder he would show sale of flat sale of land as his turnover and what he will record in his pnl account is the amount of consideration this amount will be recorded in the pnl but if that amount is less than the stamp duty value then it is the stamp duty value which should be taken as sale amount but what you have recorded in the pnl is only the consideration that means the difference has to be added to the net profit this is for somebody who has land and building as stock in trade if land and building is held as capital asset so section 50 c applies then my working would be the word income under the head capital gains will mean the full value of consideration you will take stamp duty value as full value of consideration for calculating capital gains this is what your provision is now we also are aware that in both the sections there is a relaxation technically i am doing with you the amendment in two sections relaxation in section number 43 ca and in section number 50 c what is the relaxation provided if my stamp duty value does not exceed 105% of my consideration then for income tax purposes the income that we will take is the amount of consideration not the amount of stamp duty value so a 5% margin was allowed to me if the difference between my consideration and the stamp duty value is just 5% then i will not just pay tax on the stamp duty value whatever consideration has been shown by the assessee that will be subject to tax the amendment introduced by the section is that this 105% has been increased to 110% so the margin of 5% is now 10% this is a this is a slightly beneficial provision so the impact is let's assume k the amount of consideration is 1 crore the stamp duty value is 1 crore 8 lakhs now up to previous year 1920 what did we do we would check it we would check the 105% element now my stamp duty value in this case is greater than 105% of the consideration so effectively what i would say is that the income taxable will be the stamp duty value 1 crore 8 lakhs no relaxation will be provided to me 
because my stamp duty value is now more than 105 percent. This is what I would do up to the last year. Up to the last year, this is what I would do. Now, what happens in the current year? In previous year, 2021, keeping the same example, consideration 1 crore stamp duty value, sorry, 1 crore 8 lakhs. Now, the section has given me a slightly better limit, 110 percent. My stamp duty value is less than 110 percent of my consideration amount. So, I do fall in the relaxed provisions. And so, the income that will be taxable is the amount of consideration that is 1 crore. The additional 8 lakh rupees which used to be taxed up to last year will now not be taxed. Now, the provision will have to be checked with reference to 110 percent and not 105 percent. This is the amendment applicable in section 50c also. If the stamp duty value of land and building is up to 105 percent, then the actual consideration shall be taken for computing capital gains. With effect from 2021, this limit has been increased to 110 percent and in 43CA also, the limit has been increased. This is this amendment we studied in 43C. I discussed it with reference to 43CA also and section 50C also. Now, the last amendment of the chapter of PGBP, tax audit provision. Again, something really interesting. The tax audit provision that we are aware, section 44AB, I will only put up the amendment related part on the screen. I am not putting up the entire section. It will end up confusing you with too much of data. The provision that is existing was, the provision that used to exist was, if you are involved in business activities, then up to previous year 1920, tax audit would apply if your turnover and gross receipts exceeded 1 crore. Now, effective our year, previous year 2021, the old provision of greater than 1 crore or rather, let me define it differently. The old threshold limit of greater than 1 crore is still applicable, but a new threshold limit has been created. This is the amendment. A new threshold limit has been prescribed, the threshold limit of 5 crores. Let us first read the amendment the way it has been drafted. For a person carrying on business. So, the amendment is not applicable to professionals. The amendment is only applicable if you are involved in a business activity. The aggregate of all amounts received, all amounts received including sales turnover gross receipts, amounts that are received in cash does not exceed 5 percent, which means it is less than or equal to 5 percent, does not exceed 5 percent of the amounts received. In the entire year, whatever amounts you have received, 5% or less than that is your amount received in cash. So, whatever amounts you have received, you have received 100 rupees, 5 rupees or less than that should be cash, balance 95 or more than that should be non-cash. Other than cash, it can be account pay check, it can be account pay bank draft, it can be electronic clearing system, 
it can be those rule 6 ABBA modes money received it can be bearer check also because bearer check is not cash bearer check is still a check payment it can be cross check also other than cash other than cash whatever amounts have been received they are 95 percent or more other than cash it is five percent or less than that which is in cash this is the first part and the aggregate amount of all payments amounts paid in cash does not exceed 5% of the amount paid so if amount received in cash is up to 5% and amount paid in cash up to 5% if both these conditions simultaneously get satisfied then tax audit will be applicable if the gross receipts exceed 5 crores ok let us put this in numbers example 1 during the year 2021 my cash receipts are 20 lakhs amount received in cash my non cash receipts are say 2 crore 80 lakhs so my total receipts in the year are 3 crores my cash payments made in the year are 10 lakhs my non cash payments that are made in the year are say 1 crore 90 lakhs so in all the payment made in the year is 2 crores amount received in the year is 3 crores now what is the section saying? 5% of 3 crores. 5% of 3 crores, 15 lakhs. 5% of 2 crores, 10 lakhs is, okay, let me put it in a more systematic way now. is cash receipt up to 5% of total receipts. So, look at the example. My cash receipt is 20 lakhs. My cash receipts is 20 lakhs. It is above the 5% limit. No. My cash receipt is above 5%. So, am I satisfying the amendment the amendment says my cash receipt should be less than equal to 5% and my cash receipt is above 5% then what will be the threshold limit for tax audit will it be this 5 crores answer is no then the threshold limit will be 1 crore which means in this case tax audit will apply if my turnover is above 1 crore and so suppose I take up an example that the turnover is 1 crore 26 lakh rupees. Now tax audit will be applicable. I do not satisfy the provision of the amendment, then the old threshold limit of 1 crore is still applicable and I will have to check whether tax audit applies or not, keeping in mind the old limit of 1 crore. Now let us look at the second example. Example 2. Cash receipts 2 lakhs. Non cash receipts 
टू करोर नाइंटी एट लैक्स सो माई टोटल अमाउंट रिसीव इन दर इज थ्री करोर कैश पेमेंट्स फाइव लैक्स नॉन कैश पेमेंट्स वन करोर नाइंटी फाइव लैक्स सो टोटल पेमेंट्स मेड इन दर टू करोर आई हेव केप्ट माई अमाउंट सेम एज द प्रीवियस एग्जाम्पल द टोटल अमाउंट आर द सेम आई जस्ट चेंज द इंटरनल अमाउंट सो विच मीन्स Five percent amount, fifteen lakhs, and this one will be ten lakhs. So, same set of questions now asked. Is cash receipt less than five percent of my total receipt? Answer is yes. my cash received is only 2 lakh rupees my non cash receipts are more in this case is my cash payment less than 5% of the total payment answer is yes so now when i put up an example that my turnover for previous year 2021 is rupees what was the earlier example 1 crore 26 lakhs will tax audit apply now answer is no tax audit is not applicable in this case the reason now the threshold limit has been increased from 1 crore to 5 crore and my turnover is below 5 crore so tax audit does not apply so in a way you can understand that the advantage is given to the assessee by telling him that we are relaxing you from the tax audit provisions the limit which earlier was 1 crore has been increased to 5 crores the condition attached is your majority dealings payments and receipts both should be non cash should be non cash you keep cash component as 5% of the total amounts in the year or less than that then we will insist on you getting your books audited only if your turnover is above 5 crores if your cash payment or your cash receipt is above 5% any one of the two is above 5% then we will insist that you get your books audited if your turnover exceeds 1 crore but if your cash receipts as well as cash payments are within 5% then audit is necessary required only if your turnover exceeds 5 crores then the old limit of 1 crore will not apply ha huh. one small clarification that i would like to make here is see the section uses the word mm, hmm, amounts received amounts paid so amounts received will include business receipts also and non business receipts also amounts received will also include capital receipts and revenue receipts it is the amount received during the year which means as a clarification i'll put this up i don't have enough space in that printed pdf i'll put it up here amounts received what all things will be covered as an amounts received you will cover business receipts example of business receipts 
sales turnover fee received in the course of business second non business receipts are also covered non business receipts which means amount received which is not under the head pgbp so it can be house property receipts capital gain receipts ifos receipts any personal receipts even everything of that is also covered point 3 we are covering capital receipts also meaning we are covering transactions like sale of fixed assets even sale of investments like shares and debentures will be covered we are also covering revenue receipts revenue receipts can be business non business you have given your property on rent you are earning rent income that is a revenue receipt you are selling goods that is a revenue receipt so reven you are selling of a property capital receipt but it is all amount received going by that thing it's very obvious for me to write down you will easily understand when i say amounts that are paid during the year amounts paid will also mean the same i am talking about business payments i am talking about non business payments i am talking about capital payments i purchase a fixed asset that's a capital payment i purchase a plot of land that is capital payment i purchase shares i purchase debentures i purchase mutual fund units all capital payments revenue payments are also covered i make payments of salaries electricity expenses i make payments to my creditors that is also covered as payment amounts received amounts paid will cover all amounts not necessarily pgbp not necessarily revenue everything will be covered now take all these amounts received compare the cash component with the total amounts paid compare the cash component with the total paid if cash component received is up to 5% and if cash component paid is up to 5% then the threshold limit for tax audit is 5 crores else the threshold limit is 1 crore these are ha huh, there is one more pgbp amendment it's kind of very simple assessees who are covered by tax audit they will have to submit their tax audit report one month prior to the due date of filing return now we will observe this that the due date of filing return has also undergone a change i'll quickly go through it earlier the due date used to be 30th september of the assessment year if tax audit applied now when we do the amendments relating to return of income we are going to see this amendment this date has now been extended to 31st of october so the due date of filing return which was earlier 30th september has now become 31st of october when i do that amendment i'll go a bit deeper and i'll explain this stuff to you in a slightly more technical manner right now i'm just mentioning the date because i need to use it so the date of 30th september has got an extended to 31st of october fair enough but now the requirement is that the tax audit report will have to be submitted to the income tax department one month prior to the due date of filing return so which means the last date to submit the tax audit report is now 30th of september sir what do you mean by this amendment what i mean by this amendment is earlier the date to submit the tax audit report and the date to file the return of income the due dates the last dates were the same whatever was the due date of filing return of income that due date was also applicable to submit the tax audit report now the government has said that you submit the tax audit report first to us one month prior to your due date of filing return you submit that tax audit report first because the government is now going to is in the process of developing this type of a system 
वेर अ पर्सन हु इज कवर्ड बाय टैक्स ऑडिट विल फर्स्ट सबमिट हिज टैक्स ऑडिट रिपोर्ट विद द डिपार्टमेंट विद द इनकम टैक्स डिपार्टमेंट देन वेन ही स्टार्ट फिलिंग अप हिज रिटर्न ऑफ इनकम अ मेजोरिटी ऑफ द डेटा इन द रिटर्न ऑफ इनकम विल बी ऑटोमेटिकली फिल्ड फ्रॉम द टैक्स ऑडिट रिपोर्ट सो द रिटर्न ऑफ इनकम विल बी प्री फिल्ड फिल्ड ऑलरेडी यूजिंग द डिटेल्स ऑफ टैक्स ऑडिट रिपोर्ट फॉर विच द गवर्नमेंट रिक्वायर्स द टैक्स ऑडिट रिपोर्ट इन एडवांस सो अ स्मॉल प्रोसीजरल अमेंडमेंट हैज बीन इंट्रोड्यूस दैट यू विल सबमिट द टैक्स ऑडिट रिपोर्ट एटलीस्ट वन मंथ प्रायर टू योर ड्यू डेट ऑफ फाइलिंग रिटर्न then the government will take that tax audit report it will develop a type of a software where when this assessee who is covered by tax audit starts filling his return of income the data automatically comes in pre filled then he has to just fill up the other data required in the return and then file it these are your pgbp amendments amendment in capital gains section 50c amendment i have already discussed with you it is the same amendment that was applicable in section 43c a also a second amendment something very simple you must be aware that when we do our capital gain computation there is this section 552 clause number b says that instead of taking the actual cost we can substitute the fair market value of the capital asset as on 1st april 2001 this is a provision that is already existing the amendment is that if your capital asset is land or building or both the fair market value as on 1st april 2001 shall not exceed the stamp duty value as on 1st april 2001 so if you are talking about section 55 2 clause b and the example is that building was acquired on 16th of october 1997 at a cost of 27 lakhs so now i have the option that in my capital gain computation instead of subtracting 27 lakhs as cost of acquisition i can take the fair market value as on 1st of april 2001 and so let's assume the fair market value on 1st april 2001 was rupees 38 lakhs so what we used to do was we did not subtract 27 lakhs we used to subtract 38 lakhs this is what we used to do for every capital asset including land and building now specifically for land and building government is telling you that if you adopt any valuation methodology and come up with a fair market value on 1st april 2001 check what is the stamp duty value of that land of that building as on 1st april 2001 so now i need to take into account an extra information stamp duty value on 1st of april 2001 if that stamp duty valuation comes out to 36 lakhs which is lower than the fair market value that you would have calculated using a certain valuation method so the stamp duty value adopted by the state government is 36 lakhs but you have taken a different market valuation as 38 lakhs the amendment will now tell you that your cost of acquisition will be either the actual cost 27 or what what did we do earlier we used to say 27 or 38 whichever is higher this is what we used to do now i cannot take 38 lakhs i will have to take 36 lakhs that is a stamp duty value and accordingly decide my cost of acquisition to be 36 lakhs so my market valuation done by any valuation methodology cannot exceed the stamp duty value cannot exceed the stamp duty value this is the amendment ha huh. another version let's assume 
that the stamp duty value on 1-4-2001 comes out to 43 lakhs. So use your common sense. As an assessee, I have done market valuation using a certain valuation technique which has given me 38 lakhs. But when I take the rates adopted by state government for stamp duty purposes, the stamp duty value comes out to 43 lakhs. So it is but obvious na, that in this situation as an assessee, what will I do? I will reject that 38 lakhs valuation that I have done on my own and I will say that my cost of acquisition is the actual cost of 27 lakhs or rupees 43 lakhs out of the two whichever is higher I will take 43 lakhs see what I am trying to tell you is what is the amendment saying what is the amendment telling you the amendment is telling you that the fair market value should not exceed the stamp duty valuation so if the assessee adopts a certain valuation technique and comes up with a market value which is more than the stamp duty value he will not be allowed to take that market value he has to restrict it to stamp duty value only but if his own valuation technique gives him a lower value and stamp duty value anyways is higher so it is but natural na? common sense that i will adopt the stamp duty value and then do my working your fair market value should not exceed the stamp duty value at best you can take the stamp duty value for this section these are the two amendments in the chapter of capital gains coming to the last head of income income from other sources two very significant amendments one is this 10 percent wala amendment in section 43 ca and in section 50 c we have seen that the margin of 5 percent that was allowed has been increased to 10 percent corresponding amendment needs to be done in ifs also i won't put up the entire provision in front of you but i'll just put up the relevant portion which is getting affected by the amendment and as i have done earlier in the video i'll take up an example pre-amendment and post-amendment see what is the provision section 56 2 clause number 10 it's a very lengthy section i'm not putting up the entire section i'm telling you i'm just putting up the relevant part where the amendment is getting affected where the amendment is affecting the section i'm just putting up that much we are talking about immovable property that is received for inadequate consideration The provision that existed up to previous year 1920 looked something like this. If your stamp duty value minus consideration is greater than the standard threshold limit of 50,000 or 5% of the consideration out of the two whichever is higher then income from other sources for the receiver of the property will be the amount of stamp duty value minus the amount of consideration. Certain things that are clarified before I take up a numeric example. I am just talking common sense. We are talking about inadequate consideration. That means there is a proper sale that is happening. Seller is selling, buyer is buying. There is a transfer that is happening. This provision of IFOS is from the receiver's perspective. Receiver as in receiver of the capital asset. Not receiver of the money, receiver of the capital asset. The seller gives the capital asset. He is the giver, he is the transferer he will be taxed under capital gains. The buyer is the receiver of the capital asset. He is receiving the immovable property for inadequate consideration. So when I say this word receiver of the property, effectively I mean the buyer or the transferee. 
IFRS provision will be applicable. This provision of IFRS that we are studying, this will be applicable to the buyer, to the transferee. Now, this is the provision up to previous year 1920. What is the amendment introduced? With effect from previous year 2021, this 5% will be taken as 10%. So, like the seller is given a margin of 10%, the buyer is also given the margin of 10%. Meaning, let's take an example. Mr. X is the seller. Mr. Y is the buyer. A flat is sold for 1 crore and the stamp duty value is 1 crore 8 lakhs. Now, for Mr. X, who is the seller, the head of income applicable is capital gains. Capital gains is calculated as full value of consideration minus cost of acquisition. If it is long term, it would be index cost of acquisition. I will keep the formula very simple. I am not bothered about long term, short term right now. What did we do if this transaction used to happen up to previous year 1920? Up to previous year 1920, we would say 105 percent was the margin available. The difference between the consideration and the stamp duty value should be 5 percent. My difference is above 5 percent. So, we used to take full value of consideration as 1 crore 8 lakhs. This was under section 50C. But what will we do now for the seller previous year 2021? Now it has been increased to 110 percent, which means if the consideration is 1 crore, 10 percent of that consideration. 10 lakh rupees is the margin is the difference permitted and my difference is only 8 lakh rupees. So, it is within that 10 percent margin. So, now I would not take 1 crore 8 lakhs, I would only take 1 crore rupees as per that section 50 C. I would subtract the cost of acquisition and this would be the amount of capital gain. So, you can observe that for the seller the provisions have changed. He is getting a relaxation in terms of capital gains. Now, for the buyer also, there has to be the corresponding change. If you do not put up this amendment for the buyer under the head IFRS, it would be wrong. What is IFRS provision telling you? Take the stamp duty value to begin with, compare it with the consideration find out how much consideration was inadequate, then what is the standard amount that is given in section 56 to 10? I would compare it with 5 percent of the consideration, take the higher of the two higher of the amount at 0.4 and 0.5. Then I would take the difference amount that is the inadequate consideration. Is that inadequate consideration greater than higher amount? If yes, then I would say income from other sources amount taxable would be a certain thing would be the difference between stamp duty value and consideration. Now, let us solve the same example, but up to previous year 1920. How would the working look for Mr. Y? Consideration 1 crore 8 lakhs, sorry, stamp duty value 1 crore 8 lakhs. Consideration 1 crore. Inadequate consideration 8 lakhs. So, the inadequate portion is 8 lakh rupees 
the standard amount in the section 50,000, 5% 5 of the consideration, my consideration is 1 crore, so 5% will be 5 lakhs. Out of the two, whichever is higher, 5 lakh rupees. Is my inadequate consideration greater than the higher amount? Answer is yes. Then whatever is the inadequate consideration, SDV minus consideration, that means 8 lakh would be taxable as income from other sources. Now this is what used to exist. You are aware of this provision. Effective previous year 2021, like for the seller, we have increased the threshold from 5% to 10%. So I would put it something like this that up to previous year 1920 stamp duty value was greater than 105 percent therefore we said stamp duty value became taxable but effective our year it is no longer 5 percent it is 10 percent so stamp duty value is less than 110 percent and therefore we did not adopt the stamp duty value we adopted the normal consideration only the same concept for seller is now applicable for the buyer also. Stem duty value 1 crore 8 lakhs. The consideration 1 crore. The inadequate portion 8 lakhs. The standard amount 50,000. But now it is not 5 percent. Now I have to check it as 10 percent of my consideration. So if my consideration is 1 crore my 10% amount is 10 lakhs, higher of the two, 10 lakh rupees, is my inadequate portion, 8 lakhs, greater than 10 lakhs, answer is no, then income from other sources, nothing will be subject to tax, I cannot tax the buyer for the inadequate consideration of 8 lakhs, like I have not taxed Mr. X the seller for that inadequate portion of 8 lakhs. So if you have taken 1 crore rupees as consideration for the seller, you have to take 1 crore rupees as consideration for the buyer, which means there is nothing inadequate in this case. So the amendment that was introduced for the seller in capital gains, that amendment equally is applicable for the buyer also. This is your first amendment as far as income from other sources is concerned. Second amendment, something very important, something very simple yet important. Under the head income from other sources, we used to talk about dividend income. And we said, if you get dividend income on shares of A domestic company then this dividend was exempt for the shareholder under section 1034 because the domestic company was supposed to pay dividend distribution tax under section 1150. If they were shares of a foreign company, then the provisions of dividend distribution tax are not applicable, which means this dividend was taxable for the shareholder and dividend income is always taxable as income from other sources. The provisions of DDT were never applicable to a foreign company. If you were receiving dividend on shares of a cooperative society, then also the concept of DDT was never applicable. But instead of calling this person as a shareholder, we would say he is a member of a society. So it was taxable for the member as income from other sources the provision of DDT was never applicable to a cooperative society. But if you are talking about dividend income on 
units of a mutual fund then the provision that used to exist was that this dividend was exempt for the unit holder under section 10 subsection 35 and dividend distribution tax was applicable for the mutual fund under section 115R. We are already aware of all of this. The amendment introduced is that dividend distribution tax has been abolished. Now the government is shifting to the classical way, the normal way of taxing the dividend in the hands of the receiver. Dividend is income of the shareholder, dividend is income of the unit holder. So tell that person to pay tax, which means provisions of DDT are abolished. Section 115O deleted, Section 115R deleted. Common sense that if Section 115O and 115R, these two DDT sections are deleted, it means this exemption is also no longer applicable. Section 1034 and 1035 are also not applicable. And it means now dividend income is taxable for the receiver. Whether they are shares of domestic company or foreign company or cooperative society or their units of mutual fund, the impact of the amendment is very simple. Now dividend income is taxable for the receiver as income from other sources section number 56.2. Connected to this, there are, sorry, connected to this, there are two more amendments that you need to take care of. First is this dividend income. Second, now we are talking about expenses which are allowed as a deduction under section 57. Related to dividend income, purely related to dividend income, the only expense that is allowed is interest on loan. This is the only expenditure that is allowed as a deduction against dividend income. So the entire section 57 is not amended or deleted. Specifically related to dividend income, the only expenditure that is allowed as a deduction is interest on loan. Any other expense is not allowed as a deduction. We used to have an, a deduction of bank charges, collection charges for dividend income, no longer available. The only expenditure permitted as a deduction is interest on loan and that too, they have put a maximum limit here. Maximum deduction that will be permitted is up to 20% of the dividend income. So there are two implications of this. First, as I told you, no other expenditure will be allowed as a deduction. What will be allowed as a deduction is only interest on loan. Second, even this interest on loan will be allowed as a deduction up to a maximum of 20%. That means if you are earning a dividend income of 5 lakh rupees and you are paying an interest of more than 20%, that is more than 1 lakh rupees. If your dividend income is 5 lakhs, 20% will mean 1 lakh. Now, if your interest is above 1 lakh, the full interest will not be allowed as a deduction. Only 1 lakh will be allowed. 5 minus 1, 4 lakh will be taxable. If your interest is below 20%, then the actual interest will be subtracted. But interest on loan, about 20% of dividend income will not be allowed as a deduction. This is the second amendment introduced. Third, if you remember, We had a section 
of tax rate section 115 b b d a this section said that 115 b b d a is in addition to dividend distribution tax the section was something like this that whatever dividends a shareholder would receive from domestic companies from all the domestic companies whatever dividend was received to the extent that dividend exceeded 10 lakhs the excess would be taxed at the rate of 10% and this tax was payable by the shareholder broadly speaking this is what the section was so dividend distribution tax would still be applicable the domestic company which was paying dividend would pay ddt on the entire dividend amount but as a shareholder if i receive dividend from various domestic companies and the aggregate exceeded 10 lakhs then on that excess i would pay income tax from my own pocket at the rate of 10% now guys if ddt has been abolished then there is no sense of having this section so 115 bbda also has been abolished which means the implication is that dividend income will be taxed for the shareholder at the regular tax rate at the regular tax rate applicable so if an individual is receiving dividend whether it is below 10 lakhs or about 10 lakhs he will pay tax on this dividend as per his normal slab rates if a partnership firm is receiving dividend below 10 lakhs or about 10 lakhs the firm will pay tax at the rate of 30% if a company is receiving dividend from other companies then below 10 lakhs or about 10 lakhs company will pay tax at the rate of 25% or at the rate of 30% whatever rate app is applicable to the company so your regular income tax rates will apply ha huh. you may also remember that there was a section that we studied section 115 b b d this section told us that if a foreign company paid dividend to an indian company which means in my example the indian company is a shareholder then this dividend that was paid would be taxed at the rate of 15% 15% income tax rate this was dividend received from a foreign company so the shareholder would pay tax 15% income tax rate would be paid by the shareholder now see observe the amendment it's very common sense what is the amendment ddt has been abolished ddt has been abolished what does this mean domestic company paying dividend no ddt mutual fund paying dividend no ddt what i am trying to point out is dividend received from domestic company earlier was exempt now is taxable for shareholder dividend received from mutual fund units earlier was exempt for the unit holder now is taxable but dividend received from a foreign company earlier was also taxable now is also taxable so there is no change no amendment in 115 bbd 115 bbd is still applicable in the same manner because 115 bbd is talking about dividend income received from a foreign company where there is no change so there is no change in foreign company dividend 115 bbd will equally apply if the shareholder is an indian company indian company will not pay tax as per its regular rate indian company will pay tax at this concessional rate of 15% 115 bbda 
has been deleted but 115BBD is still applicable. So guys this brings us to the end of the first part of my amendment list. I told you that we will be discussing amendments in two parts. The first part is discussing all the amendments up to the heads of income. In the second part of the video, now you will observe, we will be discussing amendments on other chapters. The chapters that you have at CA inter after your heads of income, clubbing of income, set off and carry forward of losses, deductions from gross total income, filing of return of income, advanced tax and interest, TDS, TCS. These are the chapters that are in your syllabus after the heads of income. In the second video, we will discuss amendments relating to these chapters. There are many, many, many amendments in the chapter of TDS tax deducted at source. There are no amendments in clubbing of income, no amendments in set off and carry forward of losses, no amendments in the chapter of advance tax, interest. There are amendments in the chapter of return of income. Amendments in the chapter of deductions from gross total income. Amendments in the chapter of TDS, multiple amendments. And in that second video, I will be discussing something very important with you. You guys would be aware from your general knowledge that a new tax regime has been introduced. New set of slab rates have been introduced. That is an amendment which is a significant a lengthy discussion that covers the entire syllabus of DT. So that is something that I will do towards the end. In the second video, we will have all these amendments. This video will be uploaded on YouTube and in the YouTube description, I will be giving you the YouTube link. I will be giving you the Google Drive link of this handwritten notes that I've been using in the lecture plus this printed notes with all these amendments. This printed notes cover amendments of the entire syllabus. So video number one and video number two, all the amendments printed are there in this PDF. There will be a Google Drive link. You can download this PDF and you can download the handwritten notes as well. Also in the YouTube video, in the description, I will be sharing my email ID with you. When you are studying the subject of DT, any doubt in the subject that you have, whether it's related to the amendments or generally, please post a mail please send me a mail on that email id and just give me a day or two's time to be able to address that email i will be solving the doubts i'll be replying to that email i would prefer that if you have a certain doubt in the subject you probably click a photo of the doubt from the material where you're studying and it would be very easy for you to describe the doubt and it will be very simple for me to understand your doubt and reply so send when you send an email if it's possible, try and send a photo of that particular page or that particular provision or the particular example where you have a doubt and you can easily describe the doubt and I'll be able to reply to that doubt very quickly because I'll understand it very easily. So very soon I'll be uploading the second video also. Till then, happy studying, concentrate on the amendments relating to heads of income and see you soon. Bye-bye.